I want to talk a little bit about solving for the pH of a buffer solution using an ice box, which is sort of the long way, but it conceptually shows kind of what we're doing and how we can bring together the different concepts that we've been talking about with equilibrium for weak acids and weak bases and, uh, you know, Ka values and Kb values. And then also this common ion effect. So we have these common ions that are in there, which can create these buffering systems. Buffering systems resist large changes in pH. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing to do to look at the pH for those buffering systems. And then how they change when you add a little bit of a strong acid or a little bit of a strong base. So um, if we have a problem that looks like this, um, what is the pH of a buffer prepared by adding? So we're adding 30 mils of 0.15 acetic acid, which is um, essentially household vinegar, right? Acetic acid, if you have a dilute solution of it, is our household vinegar. And then we have 70 mils of 0.2 molar sodium acetate. I always joke with my students that in this time of the year, um, all of my examples revolve around food, and um, this chemical compound being called nacho is in alignment with that. So I love nacho. Sodium acetate is one of my favorites. So I'll have a few examples in upcoming videos that involve that kind of chemical formula. So let's think about what we're actually creating here. We have acetic acid, and if we think about acetic acid, so here's our H. C2H3O2, and that's the acetate ion with its negative one charge, so it's a monoprotic acid. Acetic acid is a weak acid, and if I was to ask you what the conjugate base was for this acid, then you would say, well, the conjugate base is what happens when I don't eat my acidic hydrogen, so my conjugate base is going to be um, just the acetate ion. Now, sometimes you'll also see this written, organic chemists like it written like this. So you'll see it both ways. They both are acetate, the acetate ion. And that's your conjugate base to your acetic acid, which is, again, a weak acid. So if I have a solution that has some acetic acid in it, and I have some sodium acetate, then I have some of my acetate ion, then I have a buffering solution because I have a weak acid and its conjugate base. And so they're all in there in solution. So when I react these together, I mix them together, they're going to reach equilibrium, and then they're going to be doing this kind of back and forth chemistry where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. We'll have some spectator ions in there, like the sodium, for example, will be just hanging out, not really being part of the overall chemistry. But when I see a problem like this where it is asking for a pH, uh, it's talking about a buffering solution, we're thinking about a weak acid equilibrium, then that should automatically trigger an ice box, right? We want to make an ice table, we want to make an ice box. <clears throat> and so what we'll need to do that is the concentrations of these things for what I put together in the first place, because I need that initial line of my ice box, the eye of my ice box, to figure out kind of what happens when these things reach equilibrium. So because I'm not given initial concentrations, I'm given a starting amount of a certain concentration, my first step in a problem like this is to calculate the number of moles. And I need the number of moles of each component, and then I'll divide those by the total volume. So we'll divide by the total volume and that'll give me my initial concentrations. And the initial concentrations are what we want because we want to put together an ice box. So we need the number of moles of each component. We need the total volume, which is going to be 100 mils, right? 30 mils of my acetic acid, 70 mils of my sodium acetate. And so we can figure out our number of moles of each component using the same way that we have been. So here's our 30 mils, because we love ourselves some dimensional analysis, C2H3O2. And we're going to go from milliliters to liters, and then using the concentration, we can use that as a conversion factor as well. That gives me the number of moles per one liter.
So when I run the numbers on this, I'm going to be limited to two significant figures from my concentration. I have three from my volume, but as we are working the problem here, we'll have to round to two. So that gives me 4.5 times 10 to the negative third moles of my acetic acid. Now I'm going to do the same thing for my moles of sodium acetate. So I'm going to start off with my 70 mils. And I go from mils to liters. And for those of you who are doing chemistry for a while, then this is probably old hat. But the nice thing about dimensional analysis is it's just sort of relaxing. I like doing dimensional analysis. I could do this all day. Now I'm going to do a step here that's a little bit implied. And you could roll a lot of these steps together. You could do this conversion in your head, I'm sure, just by moving a decimal place. This is a one-to-one -one ratio because I have one mole of acetate for every one mole of sodium acetate, right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio between my component pieces. So again, this is a little bit redundant, although necessary if we're thinking about the math involved in dividing out my units. So this will give me answers in moles of the acetate ion, which is this 1.4 times 10 to the negative 2 moles. Now, we're going to have to divide to in order to get to the concentration, we need the total volume, which we said is 100 milliliters, which if we converted that to liters, which is what we need, then we would just say that it's the 0.1 if we just move our decimal place there. All right, so we have number of moles of our acetic acid. We have number of moles of our acetate. Make sure we have specific units there at the acetate ion. And we have a total volume. So I can take each of these numbers and divide by this 0.1 to give me the molarity, the concentration for each of these. And that's what I'm going to need to plug into my ice box. Now the ice box for this problem is going to be built around the buffering system. So we said we have this buffer, it's made of acetic acid and the acetate ion. So the system we're really looking at is this weak acid equilibrium. So when we build the ice box using the numbers that we just had, so we're doing our moles divided by our concentration gives us 4.5, whoops, that's 4. 4.5 times 10 to the negative 2. That's what I get for talking and writing. The brain, only enough energy for one, not the other. 4.5 times 10 to the negative 2. And again, that's in molarity. I'm going to disregard my water here because it's a pure substance. We have 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratios. So at equilibrium, that's going to be my concentration. Now hydronium. We don't have any to start off with because we didn't specifically start off with an acid. We started off with a weak acid, but it hasn't started to dissociate yet once we put it into solution. So we're going to say that this is nothing, but we're going to be gaining a molar quantity. So that's going to give us an X value here. And then with the acetate ion, this is the other component that I've started off with. So I started off with sodium acetate. From that, I got that 1.4 times 10 to the minus 2. So when I divide that by the 0.1 of my total volume, that gives me 0.14 molar acetate that I'm starting off with. Again, I'm gaining a molar quantity for this. So that's going to be my equilibrium concentration. So there's my ice box. And if I'm thinking about this in terms of a weak acid, which it is, then I'd have a Ka value, A for acid. And I'm going to have the concentration of my hydronium times the concentration of my acetate divided by the concentration of my acetic acid. And when I look up this Ka value, because weak acid Ka values are pretty readily available, you can look them up in tables or they'd probably be given to you by your professors. 
then I find that it's 1.7 times 10 to the negative fifth. So now I can plug in kind of my values here, right? So if I plug in my x and my 0 0.14 plus x plus, plus, and then that's all divided by my 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2 minus x. Then this is the equation I'm looking to solve. Now if we want to see if we can make the math friendlier, which is what we always want to do, right? It's always nice to make the math a little friendlier. Then we need to decide if we can disregard these x's. And the way that we decide if we can disregard the x's is by comparing this value, the value of my concentrations, to the value of the Ka value. If they have greater than a thousand times difference, then we can disregard the x. And in this case we have greater than or at 10 to the third difference. So we're going to disregard our x's to kind of make uh, the math prettier. And really the reason we can do that is because of the number of sig figs we have. We have two significant figures for each of these guys. The x is going to be so small that when you add or subtract the x to these values, they're essentially going to round out. So we're going to disregard x. But we're only disregarding x with respect to the concentrations. So that makes my equation this now. Which is cleaner, right? So then we just have some numbers here. We can divide both sides by that number. We end up with an x value that is equal to 9.46 times 10 to the negative sixth. Okay, now I kind of grew some sig figs along the way here, so um, we'll have to round at the end. But let's remind ourselves what we just solved for, right? We created an algebra problem. We solved for x. We're chemists, though, so x has a physical meaning. It has a physical quantity. In this case, the x value is the value of my hydronium, so that's the concentration of my hydronium at equilibrium. And why does that matter? Well, the initial question, if we go back to our original problem, is what is the pH of the system? So what happens when I prepare this buffer? What is the final pH value? So essentially that's asking for the concentration of hydronium because we know that the pH is equal to the negative log of that concentration. And when we plug that in, and again at the end here we're going to be limited to two significant figures, then we end up with a pH of 5.26, with two significant figures being the ones that are after the decimal place here. So this is a pH value with two sig figs, and that answers the question of what is the pH um, of my buffering solution. Now, now that you know kind of the starting point of your pH, now you could add things to it like what happens when I add a specific concentration of HCl? Um, how does that change things? Or what happens if I add a specific concentration of sodium hydroxide? How does that change things? And then you can look at the difference in the pH as you start to tweak and change these equilibrium concentrations. But this is kind of the start. This is where we start off with with using an icebox to solve for the pH of our buffering systems. And I'll show you a little shortcut trick using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation in a future video.